Um, well, thank you guys all for coming. Um, this is PhD Confirmation Seminar, and my thesis title is Processes Underlying Niche Partitioning and Ecological Versatility in a Field of Holding and Amsel Dishes, supervised by Jeff Jones and Mark McCormick. I want to start off first by breaking the thesis into the two main terms that I'll be talking about, niche partitioning and ecological versatility. Now, what is an ecological niche? It's been defined by Elton as the status of an animal within its community and its place in the biotic environment. And the, de the definition of a niche is varied and changed even within fields, but I chose this definition um, partly just because of the biotic environment component. So in the two dinosaurs examples, the top dinosaur is filling that short tree, whereas the bottom dinosaur is filling that kind of biotic environment of tall trees. Now the second definition I'd like to show you is by Hutchinson. And he describes an ecological niche as an n-dimensional hypervolume enclosing the complete range of conditions under which an organism can successfully and really the key point is the complete range of conditions. So for example, with this one, um, it's the complete range of, say, tree height that this animal specializes in. But really what his work did is kind of one of, one of the major fundamental things that brought niche partitioning up. And what niche partitioning is, is let's say we have a third dinosaur that can actually get in both of these different uh, environments. If you take away one of the dinosaurs, this animal can partition towards the small shrub, whereas this one still is partitioned towards the tall tree. Now the second term, ecological versatility. It's defined as the degree to which an organism can fully exploit the available resources within its local environment. And there's really two different types of organisms that I'm talking about. One being a generalist, the other being a specialist. These occupy kind of a versatility range, so two opposite ends of the spectrum. First, a generalist, a good example is a possum, something with a wide range and a very broad diet. It can be eating pizza in my trash can one night and switch to Chinese food in your trash can the next night. <laughs> and it's really also, as far as a niche partition, it has a very adaptable niche space. If I stop throwing away pizza and start throwing away Indian food, it's going to switch to Indian food. The exact opposite is a specialist. An example is a koala, basically. Only found in eucalyptus trees, primarily eating eucalyptus leaves. Something that has a very specific niche space. So how do these two um, important terms interact in natural communities? Well, versatile species can actually change their resource use, remember, switching from trash can to trash can, partitioning the resources. Conversely, a non-versatile species could get eliminated, like the dinosaur that went extinct, and open up resources for other species, remember that medium dinosaur that started filling the small, small shrubs. Now, really the underlying mechanism between both these is competition. We all know a lot about competition, it's been widely studied in both marine and terrestrial systems, Typically, it's about some sort of limited resource, resource relative to the demand. Things like shelter, habitat, food, um, mates, lab space, grants. These are the kind of things that people compete over. And there's kind of two main forms. Interspecific, which is between different species, and intraspecific, which is between the same species. Both of these different types of competition influence spatial and temporal patterns in natural community, communities, and is a way that um, a lot of the ecosystems are actually structured. It's also the fundamental mechanism behind niche partitioning and ecological specialization. So it's very important for my thesis. So getting to coral reefs. Coral reefs is a competitive playground. Um, there's lots of competition going on with corals as well as fishes. And one of the reasons is because it's such a diverse um, available habitat space. So a lot of different things. Things like reef flats, reef crests, or reef zones, different zones. In addition to that, different substrate types. So different types of corals, different abundances of coral. Um, different algal things, all sorts of that kind of stuff, um, really leads to a diverse range of habitat space. And what that means is it's a really wide range of ecological niches waiting to be filled by species, which is why coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse assemblages known. This means that there's further ecological separation amongst these species since there's so many of them. So if you remember ecological versatility in generalist specialists, a generalist example would be Thalassoma lunare, which is basically going everywhere on the reef, eating just about anything it can get get to. I'm sure many of you know it and potentially are a little bit annoyed by this species. The opposite end, um, Flavissimus is a specialist, um, highly specialized snout for feeding on things like exposed polyps or um, small invertebrates within tight spaces. These are two basically different ranges of ecological versatility. Now, species partition resources for a few main reasons. One, to minimize competition and also increase their fitness success. This makes sense. You want to compete less and eat more. Within coral reefs, competition has been highly debated and studied a lot. This is a figure from Bonnie et al., a recent review paper on competition. And what I want you to first focus on is the blue line. Over a year, increasing studies and publications invoking the word competition. 
Now, firstly, there's a little bit of a disconnect here. The yellow bars are actually the papers that have experimentally tested competition. So a lot of papers are talking about competition, but few are actually experimentally testing it. Of these, species, of these papers that have experimentally tested competition, they show that intra- and interspecific resource partitioning happens. In addition of these, there's a few removal experiments that have been done to measure competition. But few studies really address the role of competition and explain fine-scale resource partitioning, especially with dental fish. Now that's fine-scale, but about regional scale along the latitudinal gradient. We know that diversity decreases with increasing latitude in coral reefs, for example, the coral sea to the GBR. In a paper by Bell and Hughes in 2001, plotted species composition over latitude. And I really want you to focus on these two red lines, basically decreasing species composition for both corals and fishes as you go further away from the equator. One of the main take home points from their, their work is that it was actually suitable habitat decreasing that had the strongest relationship um, with both of these curves. So it's not just actual latitude, but it's things that are associated with latitude. Um, I'll be talking a lot about latitudinal gradients and stuff, but this is kind of really what I'm talking about. Now, this really gives us a natural process of decreasing habitat and decreasing species composition that's actually there. So this is a really useful tool for looking at versatility, comparing a species at one point where there's a lot of different competitors versus a species that very few competitors, as well as a decrease in habitat space. So this leads me to my damsel fish crew. Here are my seven uh, guys up in Kimby Bay. I tried to pick the brightest colors because some of my lab mates joke that they all look rubby brown and the same. But as you can see, they're really not. They're kind of cool. Um, <laughs> the reasons why I study these guys is one is because they're everywhere. They're ease of study. They occupy almost the entire substrate of the reef, as well as being um, kind of easy to experiment and manipulate because they are site attached and they do um, occupy most of the reef. It's pretty easy to actually do some they're important for the benthic environment. Studies have shown that they're herbivorous, which I'll kind of touch on later, um, as well as have other competitive interactions with things like parrotfish, surgeonfish, or other herbivores that we know are important for the reef. They hold territories, and they're highly aggressive. They actually fight for these territory spaces quite often, um, even within a span of a few minutes, which is pretty cool. They also occupy that large equatorial gradient, which brings back to versatility. Now, what do we know and what do we don't know about these guys? Differences in habitat use between species has been shown, but most of these studies focus on the actual benthic environment or just that particular individual species. There's really limited evidence for fine scale partitioning between the species. How habitat use is different at a very, very fine scale it doesn't really exist. We've done some gut content analysis, um, but a lot of the studies that have looked at gut contents um, are, I think are a little bit problematic. They're really small, they have a tiny digest, uh, digestive system, they digest things really quickly, and everything non-algal is pretty cryptic in their guts. So studies that have done this basically see a tiny green little mesh and think that it's herbivore. Um, stable isotopes gives us a finer resolution to actually look at chemical signals of what the species is eating to kind of further, further that along. This also has not been done. We know that they're territorial and that they have competitive interactions. We don't know comp competition's role in fine-scale resource partitioning, especially experimentally. We know that dominant and subordinates interact, of course, like a lot of natural systems. We don't know how this alters their niche space, especially when you remove one of these from the system. We know that there's a decrease in fine-scale partitioning along a latitudinal gradient. But this is sort of something that's been talked about a lot and a lot of papers invoke this, but actually hasn't been proven. There actually isn't really any experimental evidence for this. It's just a lot of hypotheses. In addition, versatility, um, how these species change, along the gradient hasn't been looked at. This leads me to my pro uh, project aims, which are to assess the mechanisms underlying each partitioning and versatility in a coral reef um, territorial damselfish. I want to first kind of describe where they are and what they're doing by looking at their distribution, resource use, and donation patterns up in Kibbe Bay. Explain the potential drivers behind this, looking at aggression and competition. And then next, looking at versatility after competitive removals. How, how do these species change when you actually start altering their system? And then finally, niche breadth and ecological versatility along the gradient. So kind of the same thing, these are my chapter titles. Um, quick outline, chapter one is the zonation and resource partitioning of both food and habitat. Basically a description chapter. Chapter two is starting to look at the drivers, like I said, behind this, specifically aggression. 
Chapter three is what happens when you take one of these species out of the system. How do the subordinates respond? And chapter four is taking basically all three of these chapters and looking how this may change down the gradient. So chapter one, the resource partitioning chapter, I hypothesize that there is a zonation pattern in Kimi Bay um, with limited overlap of these species. I think that one of the main mechanisms behind this is that they are partitioning habitat and food resources. And I also think that within a species, different individuals potentially may be partitioning resources differently as well, um, depending on where they are on the actual reef zone. So this work was done up in Kimi Bay, Papua New Guinea. <coughs> I chose these three sites basically to, uh, because they have very similar reef profiles. And for the zonation and habitat, I need to do surveys and basically quantify where these individuals were. I started doing um, depth stratified band transects, but I wasn't really able to pick up enough resolution between the reef crest and the reef flat areas that kind of have the same depth. So instead I did vertical reef profile surveys. And what these are is starting at 20 meters deep, the bottom of the reef slope, swimming in a zigzag pattern, 10 meters wide, one meter up. And what this gave me was a 10 meter by one meter zone that I could actually compare very fine scale differences from the tip of the reef crest back by one meters all the way to the back of the reef slope. I did three replicates per site, as for the diet, um, as I mentioned, stabilized scopes needs to be done. I'm doing bulk stabilized scope analysis, which is basically collecting white muscle tissue from the species of interest and comparing them to dietary items. And what I'm going to be using with this is basically plotting their nitrogen and carbon traces and signals. Um, and I'm going to get into this in a little bit, but basically looking at how the dietary items compare to the actual fish's muscle tissue to see if those line up. Jumping into some chapter one results. I'm going to break this down a little bit. On the y-axis is the percent of individuals found, and on the x-axis is the actual reef profile from the reef flat, reef crest, and then down to the reef slope. So breaking this up into the reef flat species first on the left side, um, you see Trichomatidus and Unimaculatus have a really pretty awesome inverse relationship, where Trichomatidus is, Unimaculatus not. And this is what we see when we actually go out in the reef flats. There's a very, very fine scale, about a meter zonation between in addition, on the reef slope, over here we have Nigoris with another inverse relationship with Burrowi, the brown line going down. Basically, because I think the reef slope is a little bit bigger, there's a lot more space, the sonation pattern is a little bit elongated versus the reef flap, which is pretty stark. But we still see the same patterns here. So Burrowi is being pushed to the bottom of the reef slope, potentially by Nigoris. The reef flap species also show a pretty cool pattern. First, um, the red line, Lacrimatus is pretty much the primary sole occupier of the center point, the midpoint of the reef crest. This is pretty interesting. I think this is potentially a prized real estate location for these species. So interesting, conversely enough, bimodal distribution with purple line, Adelis, around where Lacrimatus is, kind of getting pushed away um, to the bottom of the reef crest and to the back of the reef crest. In addition, Bankinensis, the green line, is really the only species that's actively competing for space so a lot of these other species are kind of zoned out in bars, if you like that way. But this is one of the species that actually is competing for space right behind Lacrimatus. So yes, there's a zonation pattern, but very limited overlap within these species. How, do, how about habitat and how does this change? So back to the reef flat species, looking at habitat use. On the y-axis is count, on the x-axis is the different substrate types I found these guys on. Um, I did habitat availability as well with the manly selectivity index but it's a little bit too much information, so take my word for where is what. So I really want you to focus on Fedina first, with Trapping Tatas, basically actively selecting this, as well as rubble and gravel for the Immaculata. So they are partitioning these resources, which is really cool. On the reef slope, Agoras and Burrowai are doing the same thing with their habitat as well. The same thing count versus the different types of substrate. You see that Nagoras is primarily on turf, and burrow is primarily only on rubble. So rubble and turf are an equal abundance on the entire reef slope as far as my habitat stuff went. So these individuals are actually partitioning these resources, which is pretty cool. This is a potential driver about why they are where they are. Um, and potentially because they are competing for space, they are partitioning these resources. The reef crest guys also show a pretty cool pattern. Um, the first thing that stands out is the red bar in the middle, Lacrimatus on turf. Remember, he's the sole occupier of the reef crest, and he's pretty much only on turf. So remember ecological versatility and specialist versus generalist? Lacrimatus could be a really good example of a specialist, actively selecting the reef crest tip and turf. 
When you look at the green bars, Bankinensis and Purple, Adelis, they could potentially be more like a generalist. Basically, this guy is fighting for space anywhere where he can get, and any habitat he's going to take, because that's basically all he can have. So I think this is kind of starting to allude towards ecological versatility, maybe playing a role in how these species are zoned. So that's habitat. What about food resources and how may that change? So with the food resources, I collected 12 individuals per my two sites and basically did dissections, uh, odorless, liver, gonads, as well as the major point, the white muscle tissue sample on my side. As well, I collected all the different algal types and dietary items. And this table on the left sort of breaks down all the stuff I collected per site, but I really want you to focus on this graph, the nitrogen versus the carbon, and what I'm expecting to see. I really, I'm really interested in three different traces or signals, one being algae and herbivores, the second being plankton and planktivores, and the third being detritus and detritivores. So really when we actually plot this stuff out, what we get is all the plankton and zooplankton show up on the pelagic side, all the reef stuff, detritus and say algae, stuff shows up on the reef side. So then when we actually look at what the fish is doing, say where it plots out right there, you can say that what, up one trophic level of megaworks is probably a plankton In order to flesh out this signal just a little bit more, um, I also collected various individuals. For the plankton side, I collected two known plankton forest amphibish, as well as white muscle tissue from barnacles and clams, sessile invertebrates. For the reefs, I collected all the different types of algae, Acantheris lineatus, um, Sagantis volcanis known herbivores, and for the detritus, I collected detritus from plankton toes, the benthos, and tinnicus stratus to see where it aligned. So for chapter one conclusion, this is the finest donation and partitioning of resources documented in coral reef dishes. Because that's such a fine scale on the reef press, this is really cool. As well as there's habitat partitioning going on, and I hope to see if there's a little bit of food partitioning going on when I get the sample. So chapter two is about what drives this mechanism. Yes, that chapter kind of showed that this is what's going on. Maybe competition and aggression is behind this. So for my next chapter, um, I hypothesize that conspecific aggression between the same species is going to be the highest, followed by any associated neighboring species, and then all other species. I think that Lacrimatus, remember that big red line that's basically on the tip of the reef crest? I think that's going to be the most aggressive species and be the dominant competitor. Conversely, I think the reef flat species are basically kind of being pushed down, they're going to show lower aggression and be a weaker competitor. Now to do this, I did this up in Kimmy Bay, and I used back studies to kind of look at aggression. And what back studies are is basically fish cage fighting. You place an intruder into a bag, it's closed, filled with seawater, into a resident species territory, and basically observe what happens for four minutes. I have seven species of interest, all seven of species saw all seven species at least ten times in the bag as well as an empty bag, which acted as a control, basically just an empty bag. For four minutes, I observed the interactions. First, investigations. Basically, it was having a snack, came and checked out what I was doing, and then went back. Um, most species had about one to two interactions per, um, for everything. So I kind of, I think this is probably due to me just coming into the territory and putting something down. A display is more of an aggressive display. So a fin wiggle, or a fin flare, or a lateral movement, Think of like a bull kind of stomping its hook into the ground before it charges. It's kind of an aggressive display. Third is charge, and fourth is actual contact with the bag, an actual bite attempt. Getting into some results for this, I'll walk you through this graph. On the y-axis is the mean number of aggressive behaviors per four minutes. I took out interaction or investigations because every species showed at least one to two of these. So this is the mean number of displays, charges, and bites. On the x-axis, I have the various resident species. So these are the species that I'm observing, basically the territory holders. Plotted is what's inside the back, the intruder species. Is it a control, is it all other species, or is it a conspecific, same species? And this, these bars are actually the mean, the quartiles, and then the full range of the data. And as you see, then all species showed higher aggression significantly towards conspecifics. Now this makes sense. Of course, you're going to have more aggression towards someone that's competing for mates, as well as male-to-male -male territory stuff. So this is pretty cool that this also holds for territorial tails of fish. Taking this one step further from my stuff, I'm more interested in associated species. Remember associated species are kind of like a neighboring species. And for, uh, for me, I did two meters away from the focal or resident species center point of the territory. So these are basically the species that um, are surrounding it. And what you see is that all species also showed a higher association um, aggression 
which is pretty cool. This is sort of what you'd expect if there's that tight knit of an overlap and zonation pattern. So this is a potential driver between why there's such limited over overlap between species. Kind of looking at this first species, remember the zonation graph? For the reef flat species, these two on the left, and Burroa, the bottom of the reef slope species on the far right, there's lower aggression for all of these compared to everyone else. I was kind of expecting this. The reef flat is a very intense environment, obviously, because tidal swings, there's less coral complexity, things like that. I think that these species have other things to deal with rather than be aggressive in both territory spaces. That being said, they still are more aggressive towards their own species in common specifics, or own species and associated, but it's pretty interesting. Looking at the other three species, Nagoris, Adelis, and Lacrimatus. Um, Nagoris and Adelis show, yes, more aggression towards associated, but I was really expecting Lacrimatus, remember that red line on the top, to be really pretty much the most aggressive. Instead, we showed that Bankinensis was the most aggressive. At first, this didn't really make sense, but when you look at the zonation graph, this is the only species that's actually kind of coexisting with one another. So I think that potentially this guy's job is a little harder when he's trying to hold his space. Also, look at the non-associated for this one. It's almost equal um, to all the other associated aggression. So not only is this one very aggressive to any associated species, but it's very aggressive to everyone, basically. This is really interesting, and this will have a factor into my third chapter. So yes, um, my first hypothesis showed true. No, Lacrimatus actually wasn't the most aggressive, it was Bankinensis. And there was low aggression on the weak class species. Now, in my original hypothesis, I had dominant and weaker competitors. I think that what I showed here wasn't really absolute aggression or competition. So to take this one step further to make sure that, say, Lacrimatus is really, really dominant, but it just doesn't make that many aggressive interactions. What if when it does make one, it's really powerful? So what I'm going to do is going to go back and look at some win-loss ratios of any observed interaction between these species to try to flesh out that a little bit more. So chapter three is about taking all that and then pulling one of the competitors out of the system, a removal experiment. And my first hypothesis is that the subordinates will expand their diet, habitat use, and location on the reef after the competitive removal, basically broadening its niche space. I think that um, post-release subordinates' gonad size and body condition will improve, basically because less competitive interactions. And I think that the benthic environment will change after a decrease in territorial species, because I will be wiping out um, one species of territorial individuals. So if we remember the reef crest, um, Lacrimatus, very dominant on the actual tip of the reef crest, Adelis, the pool by mode distribution around it, and then Bankinensis, the most aggressive, and the only one that's really kind of duly fighting for space. So I chose these three species to basically look at. And for the removal experiments, the first two plots are removing Lacrimatus, the red line. And if you remove Lacrimatus, I kind of think that Bankinensis, that green line, will sort of take over its spot. And Adelis will still show that bimodal distribution around the reef crest. But just in case that doesn't happen, I want to remove Bankinensis as well in two other plots. So this is the green line. And getting into ecological versatility, we think that Lacrimatus is potentially a specialist. If it is truly a specialist, and we take out Bankinensis, it should stay on the reef crest and not expand its habitat that much, and not take over the reef flat front as well. So I'm going to be interested in like where species move, basically. I'll be doing two control plots to make sure I'm not messing with anything. And as far as the timeline goes, for two months I'll be fine scale monitoring these um, interactions. And basically what that means is every day going there, removing any of the individuals, depending on which plot, that come back. So I will keep these complete removal plots. For two months, I think that that will be enough time. I think that within about a week, these species will already basically fill that zone. So then after two months, I'm going to stop removing all the individuals that come into the system. And this will kind of give me a post-disturbance recovery of what will happen afterwards. So you take out lacrimatis, you continue to be taking them out, taking them out, taking them out. Bankinensis takes over, and then I stop taking out lacrimatis. Will lacrimatis come back and continue to take over that reef crest, or will the system actually hold in place? And lacrimatis basically just lost a bunch of habitat. <laughs> so here are my plots, um, 10 meters long by 8 meters wide, um, 4 meters down the reef slope, 4 meters back on the reef crest. And I'll be doing a 2 meter buffer zone around that plot to basically minimize a guy that's right there interacting with my plot. So this is actual monitoring plot. This is sort of a buffer zone. What I'll be doing for the surveys is doing transected grids in two by two meters. 
For the fish, I'll be looking at ID, size, territory, habitat use, pretty much everything, but particularly the location within that grid. The location within the grid through ArcGIS, I can basically plot that input layer into minimum complex polygons and see the movement over time within each grid. So this is kind of how I'm going to show the movement of a species, basically taking over a space or competing for that habitat use that I basically cleared up. For the benthic, I'll be doing photo quadrats, basically taking pictures, looking at habitat, substrate, and cover within these. So that covers how the habitat and the subordinates will change, as well as the benthic environment. For the diet and how gonad size and body condition may change. I'll be collecting 12 individuals throughout each species after I finish all the plots, basically at the end of the experiment, and comparing them to those chapter two fish that I took. So this is kind of going to be my proxy for how a species may change if it gets more fit or not, basically. This leads me to chapter four, which is taking this down along a gradient, um, looking at versatility specifically. I'll be specifying and quantifying habitat use, location, where all these species are, territory size, all that kind of stuff. I hypothesize that territorial dense fish will be more generalized, which is basically a broader niche space, as you go further from the equator. In addition, I think there will be less fine scale partitioning within these species. So here are some potential sites. Um, I'll be selecting sites based off of similar reef profile and geographic conditions. Places like Kimby Bay are really calm, not that much wind and waves. Places like Lizard Island potentially have a little bit more wind and waves. So this is sort of the gradient that I'll be focusing on. For my species, I'm going to be surveying all territorial dams of fish, and potentially on how time consuming the survey is looking at grasses as well for a side project. But really, I'm interested in seeing how Lacrimatus changes. Remember that guy that's on the of reef crest in red in Kimby Bay? He's actually found to be a little bit lower on the reef slope at Lizard Island than Orcus. So potentially, a specialist may change to be a generalist down the green. This is kind of the set that I'm going to be looking at. And how I'll be doing this is the same vertical zigzag surveys that I talked about in the first chapter, but adding an additional benthic component. So for each one of these 10 meter horizontal swims, I'll be doing some point intercepts um, to basically classify what the substrate is. In conclusion, my chapter one showed the resource partitioning and habitat, hopefully food when I get that data back, as well as a really cool fine scale zonation with limited overlap for these species. Chapter two looked at the drivers behind this, showing that aggression is a potential driver of why there is such limited overlap and where they are in the actual reef profile. Chapter three, I hope to show that the role of interspecific competition plays a really important factor on where they are by taking one of the species out of the system. And chapter four is taking kind of all three of these ideas and moving down the gradient to see how different species may change with different habitat um, and species composition. The novel aspects of this is these partitioning and the actual drivers and mechanisms behind this hasn't been documented at this fine of a scale for coral reef fishes. So it's pretty cool. I'm really excited to see what these removal plots basically show. For some quick logistics, I plan to submit all six of these to science and nature. So <laughs> I'll add those. Um, the first two chapters are um, kind of in prep right now. I'm waiting for that uh, dietary stable isotope back. For my chapter three, I hope to get two main ones, the removal experiment, remember. One, basically, what happens after you remove them. The second, how does body condition, diet, and fitness change for the species? So kind of one more like laboratory-based. For chapter four, I also hope to shoot for two. One, basically, a description publication of where they are, species composition, potential drivers, versatility, all that stuff I was talking about. And then maybe a fourth one, depending on what I find, how things like habitat degradation and climate change and human associated factors may influence these species distribution. For my timeline, year one is pretty much done. Chapter one and chapter two field work is completed. I'm leaving for chapter three in like four days, completely ready. And the major conference is ICRS in Hawaii, hopefully. For budget and risks, um, my costs in red are what I've already spent. Chapter four is pretty high. Uh, I got this number basically all five of those sites, all five of the bench fees, all five of the flights for two people. So this is kind of a really padded, padded budget. Thank you for my supervisors for funding my first three chapters. I'll be looking to do some grants and volunteer for my fourth one. For the risks, this chapter two um, stable isotope data may come back and they might all actually be exactly the same. 
And if this is the case, maybe they are actually the same. Or I could actually use some of my tissues that I have. I got a lot of extra tissues. And I'm looking at compound specific stable isotopes. This is kind of like a Ferrari model of isotope analysis. So a lot more expensive, but very more um, refined. For chapter four, as I said, it's a lot of trips, um, a lot of places. The time for surveys is pretty high. I need to work on kind of how to get that down, as well as not confounding my results down in geographic gradient. Basically trying to pick sites that are similar enough. Um, if this becomes a problem as far as funding goes, I can just look at two sites, see how these two sites differ, and potentially a third site volunteering for one of you guys, if that's possible. <laughs> so lastly, thank you so much to my supervisors, Jeff and Mark, for all their help, um, especially the Jones Lab for all the awesome criticism and <laughs> comments that you guys gave me. Um, particular thanks to Lisa, Patrick, and Simone for all the help in the field, um, and thank you guys all for being here.